Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. This is Prosthodontics on Friday Live, which addresses different steps in implant treatment and addresses the side effects. We first started in August 14th, 2020, and thanks to your love and support, we are now celebrating our second anniversary. We will do our best to provide programs that help with your treatment. In this lecture, celebrating the second anniversary, we put up something special. So let me first introduce our lecturer, Dr. Park jong Hyun, who has devoted himself to implant clinical research and development, has come from all the way from Seosan. Greetings, Dr. Park. Thank you for finding time to appear on Prosthodontics on Friday. So can you please provide a brief introduction of your lecture? Today, I'm going to talk about Austin TS transfer abutment and one fit abutment. I'm going to talk about the pros and cons of hex and non-hex abutments. As I studied, I've noticed that I myself don't really know clearly hex and non-hex. I'm sure a lot of people are interested in the topic of the day, and I think many people are looking forward to your lecture. Those of you watching from Dental site, you can participate real time via the chat. Leave your questions, have them answered, and by lucky draw, you can get Starbucks coffee coupons as well. In light of the second anniversary, we have prepared Maserati LED tumbler for three people who have raised best questions. And this tumbler is really a luxurious tumbler and the temperature is reflected on the lid. Get meaningful information on implant abutment and win a try your chance at winning the gifts. These coupons can be only sent to the members who agree to marketing on dental site. Without further ado, let us begin Dr. Park Jung Hyun's lecture. Greetings, I'm Dr. Park jong -hyun. The contents of the day can be divided into five as shown. Hex or non-hex? Let's take a look at this first. At one point, I intermixed hex and non-hex products. You cannot really, really sense the difference depending on hex or non-hex. The abutment shown is slightly over contoured. If you look at five years progress, problems do not result just because of such difference. Let's look at hex abutment. The biggest function is positioning. Positioning is easy. The thing that you need to be most aware about is to prevent error in connection. If you can address this, it does not matter whether you use hex or non-hex. There's controversy whether there's anti-rotation function. There may be anti-rotation function if it hits the corner as shown after it rotates 1.6 degrees, but this is not so all the time. The friction on Morse taper occurs first. The abutment may not rotate even if it does not hit the corner. It is pretty established to say that there is no anti-rotation function. In single restoration, this is recommended. Now I'm going to talk about non-hex abutment. The possibility of error upon connection is much less. Connection is more wider because the contact surface is wider. If you look at the research done in Austin, you can get good fracture fatigue life. 
in the case of non-hex, it is recommended to use it in the case of two or more cases. If you look at this section, as for hex type, there is gap, 10 micrometer gap. And, and because non-hex has wider contact surface, because of this, non-hex has more fatigue life. This is hex abutment. Let's look at the difference with non-hex abutment. If you look at the literature, non-hex is known to be more favorable in terms of stress distribution compared with hex. And this is because it has a wide contact surface. And I agree. This is a study done by Kangneung Wonju University. This addressed some of the questions I had. Will axial displacement be different for hex and non-hex abutment? A lot of people wondered on this. It was connected by 10 newtons, so it's about the tighten you get with your fingers. And when 30 newtons of additional torque was applied, axial displacement was 9 micrometer bigger for hex abutments. This is statistically meaningful. However, no significant difference was found in axial displacement after cyclic loading. I agree that both types of abutments show similar biomechanical performance levels. This is a research done by Austin Research Center. In cantilever area, cyclic loading was applied. In the area where cantilever was applied, there was difference of 5 mm. Non-hex abutment showed a bigger, better fatigue life. Because non-hex abutment has bigger contact surface, it may be more unfavorable in terms of positioning, but it does have these advantages. Let's look at a study done by Dr. Hyun dong in 2020. I personally prefer non-hex, but the dentist said that hex abutment is more favorable in terms of screw loosening and other prosthodontic complications for single tooth restoration. Let's look at pros and cons of hex abutment. This is five years after providing prosthesis. Contact loosening occurred, and in this case, hex abutment is really of great help. When I remove prosthesis to do contact adding, there are commonalities. In the hex area, there is very little sign of wear, and therefore, I believe the hex is barely in contact. In the more steeper area, there is a clear friction. I do not believe hex is in charge of anti-rotation function. After adjusting the contact using hex, it was re positioned and re-cemented. I think this is the biggest benefit of hex. You can position it to its original position. This is the biggest advantage. This is six years after and nine years after. The patient came by just recently. And I provided a new crown. If you look, I think it has something to do with the angle of the camera. Even if you use hex abutment, you can position the hex in the same position, but as for restoration, it is very difficult to put it back to its original position. Just because it's hex, it doesn't mean that you can put the restoration back to its original state. There are error and contact adjustments. If we make mistakes, deviations can occur. Another benefit of hex. When you fabricate ER type, you can cement the prosthesis. After you remove it, you can remove the cement and then reposition it. In single tooth restoration, repositioning non-hex abutment will be very difficult. This is a major advantage of hex abutment. Another major advantage of hex abutment is that it can be used in digital dentistry widely. As a non-hex user, this is a bit sad for me, but with digital scanning, connection changes occur just twice. The deviation has become reduced. Let me show you a case. So this is immediate implant placement. Awesome TS implant was placed and design was done. Custom abutment and prosthesis was fabricated at the same time. One stop method was used. This is the final prosthesis. 
Non-hacks is quite unfavorable in using digital workflow. You can remove jig and do such, but it's not easy to position like the hex. Let me show you another case. Immediate implant placement was done. If you use scanning abutment without changing impression coping, you can fabricate prosthesis at one time. Digital workflow is continuing to progress, but unfortunately, non-hex implant, the number of users are less and it's more complicated. Therefore, digital workflow progress in terms of non-hex abutment is still lacking. This is something that I want to emphasize most. If you avoid wrong connection for hex abutment, then you're fine compared to non-hex. Let's try to find a wrong connection. There's just one wrong connection. Can you see it? You can see that it is not fit properly. In the case of Austin Impression Coping, there's a notch. Therefore, it's easier to find it. The notch should be at the top of the implant. If you take x-ray well in the more steeper area, you can see wrong connection. In the case of connecting hex abutment, we need to understand whether this is wrong or correct connection. We need to avoid wrong connection at all costs. When you use awesome product, if you look at the x-ray, you can see what correct connection looks like. If you take x-ray, there needs to be no conical gap below the hex. The typical space can be observed. If this becomes elongated, you'll notice that once you start using this, if you're used to providing hex abutment, you can get a sense whether it is wrong or correct connection. Upon tightening, if it is wrong connection, then there's a weird sense. The tightening sense is different. If you have done tightening with wrong connection, by doing screw tightening, you can tell the difference between correct and wrong connection. You need to figure out your own way in figuring out whether this is wrong or correct connection. In 2012, I made wrong connection with hex abutment and I found it out too late, bone loss occurred. In the end, this implant had to be removed. In the case of implant, if there's a bit of bone loss, I think the best way to solve it is to remove the implant and to place it again. After three years, there was no need to place additional implant, so this was how the case was closed. With just wrong connection, bone loss can occur. In 2013, one fit abutment was used, and I connected it with a wrong hex connection. I corrected it immediately. If I had not done that, then the patient would not have been able to use it. This is after nine years. Such result could not have been achieved. Wrong hex connection can lead to serious implant complications. This impression coping is from company D, and you can see there's interference and there's wrong connection. This was reflected in the transfer jig and the abutment. I found this problem quickly and uh, I corrected it into correct connection. Can you see this point? This is after 10 years of screw retightening was done if I had not found that it was wrong connection in 2012, the implant would not have been maintained for 10 years. This is a case where I helped a dentist in Yosu. In three unit prosthesis, I did it together and I found wrong connection after completing setting. I removed it and did it again to provide correct connection. You don't need to ask your friend. Don't feel conflicted, just remove the prosthesis and provide a new one with correct connection. This needs to happen. If you look at prosthesis from other dentists, you can see that there are so many wrong connections and I feel heartbroken, but it's very difficult to say that this is wrong connection when you evaluate work done by other dentists. 
I just tell the patient go to the dentist who replaced your implant. The biggest problem with hex abutment is wrong connection of the hex. If you find this problem, you need to find provide a new prosthesis immediately. Let's move on to non-hex abutment. As for non-hex abutment, you need to make a transfer jig to fabricate the prosthesis. For two unit prosthesis, transfer abutment was made. Because positioning is difficult for non-hex abutment, I tighten the screw and do abutment level impression. If you take abutment level impression, the hex position problem is reduced. Another disadvantage of non-hex abutment is that it's difficult to use digital dentistry. Non-hex implant was placed. In this case, it is difficult to use guide. However, it has a major advantage as well. Can I ask you a question? In 2009, Bruno reported a study saying that if non-hex abutment is connected and if you gradually increase by 5 newton up to 45 newtons, the axial displacement becomes reduced from 7 micronewtons to 21. Therefore, the amount becomes reduced in the anterior or posterior area when you use non-hex abutment, what is the appropriate torque value? When you connect the abutment, I recommend you follow the manufacturer's directions. So by 30 newtons. Yes, according to material provided by Austin Research Center, if you do up to 35 newton centimeters, the fatigue life increases, but if it goes beyond 45, the fatigue life is reduced. If the elasticity resistance of the 2.0 screw is exceeded, the free load decreases, so I do it by 30 or 35 newton centimeters. So you tighten 35 newton centimeters and you take abutment to level impression instead of tissue level impression to reduce axial displacement. I really like abutment level impression, but with digital scanning, you can see some people providing excellent prosthesis using implant level impression. These people have a defined workflow calculating into the factor of axial displacement. Thank you for your answer. Before you carry on with your lecture, let's entertain some questions on the chat screen. Let's look at some questions and address them. The first person to leave comment is Simim6. Greetings. Byun, I look forward to Dr. Park's excellent lecture and professor's commentary. Got the rhythm? Is it okay to use in patients with severe periodontal disease or patients who are older? I'm not sure what the question is. Non-hex? I'm quite unsure. Non-hex. It doesn't really matter what age. There's DM6206. This person runs la. TS. Do you use a non-hex abutment in single cases as well? If so, what kind of case would you use it? I'm sure you're going to address it, but I'm asking ahead. Hex non-hex topic. The questions are quite similar, so I anticipated this question and made slides. I'm going to explain as I look at my slides. The toughest part for many people, what to do to use non-hex for single cases. I rarely use hex abutment, I use non-hex abutment. Whether you can do repositioning using non-hex abutment, that a lot of people ask me on this. 
Repositioning is very difficult. If the patient or the dentist has a jig, it's good, but in a lot of cases, we don't maintain it. We need to make a jig once again. And transfer jig is used to reposition it. The positioning is not exactly the same, but it is within the scope that is acceptable clinically. The position up to where the jig is. It is okay to do that with non hex apartment, and I give jig to the patient as a gift. The patient's happy because it's a gift. I always tell my patient that you need to bring it back when you need repair. The patient maintains it for a long time very well. I have the patient keep it. If it's one or two years, it's okay. But if five or ten years passes, it may be quite difficult. In that case, you need to take implant level impression again and do contact adding. Can you display the slide again? When you use a smart apartment, you can use it for single cases as well. Some people may think that it will rotate when torque is given. Shall I answer now or later as I provide my lecture? You can answer now. The friction of screw and screw head on the surface. There is a stark difference in terms of friction. If it rotates, if torque is given, friction of number one needs to be bigger than number two. This is a study done at Austin. It was connected by 10 Newton. It was rotated 20, 30. And as it was connected, the Austin researchers wanted to see if horizontal rotation was made. It may differ, but if you use Austin's product and if you gradually increase the torque very slowly so that the change felt by us is a very minimum it could be okay and in single restoration so because the more steeper connection the 11 degree connection is very strong so i think it can be used for single restorations as well in single case the general method is to use the hex abutment you can use non hex abutment for single cases as well, but it requires a bit of know-how and you need to have a lot of expert experience. You need to have more experience. You need to start off restoring single case using hex abutment. And when you attempt a non hex, you need to understand deeply about non hex and then go ahead. You need to use products provided by manufacturer and you need to tighten gradually. If you do it rapidly, it can change. Yes, thank you. Let's entertain some more questions. Last quit. If you use a non hex apartment to restore single SCRP crown after setting, do you remove cement after removing the screw or do you do supra gingival margin and always maintain non hex abutment on the implant? Setting and removing cement. To give you a straight answer, if possible, I don't remove excess cement extra orally. I try to do supra gingival margin non hex abutment single restoration repositioning it is a very difficult you can put it in similar position but it's difficult to do it in exact the same position as you do it occlusion or contact can change i can position it in a position where a lot of clinicians can relate to because i have a lot of experience using non hex but this is not a general case in the case of anterior where cement removal is not easy if it is single restoration, I would cement it extra orally because contact is not strong and, and connected like a screw type.
even if it is non-hex. For anterior area, contact is not strong, so it's okay. It will be difficult for posterior area. If you use ER type, you would not remove excess cement extra orally, but you would provide the supragingival margin. But removing cement extra orally, I think it's a major advantage of hex abutment. Beyond. As for hex, in ostem, there is a single contact for ostem and double contact for dentium product. Is double contact the reason why the dentium abutment hex fractures more easily compared with ostem? This person really knows the internal structure of implant. This is a very sophisticated question. Ostem has single contact and dentium chooses double contact. I'm not sure whether dentium implants fracture more because of it. It's difficult for me to answer. You need to carry on with your lecture, but before you do so, can you select one best question? so that we can provide the Maserati Tumblr. Among those questions, which do you think is the best question? I think the reason why I'm choosing Bion is because he raised a question which I'm really curious about as well. I want to select a Bion because this person has offered me an opportunity for me to study and grow and will respond to this person after studying. Nickname Bion, congratulations. Maserati LED Tumblr will be sent. This is very useful. I hope you enjoy it. The real-time chat event continues. Those of you who have not raised your questions yet, if you have any Thing that you want it to be answered, please raise them. Regarding implant fracture, I'm not fully aware. I don't have data. I'm not a research institute. I don't do research. But if you look at the fractured implants, fractures occur in the corner. I suspect that, that corner is where it is most vulnerable to fracture. If you remove corners, perhaps we'd be able to use a smaller diameter implants more easily. That's why Austin provided non-hex implants. It's the same concept as the glass window of airplane. In the past, we thought making the window thicker would solve the problem of the window fracturing. However, after three plane crashes, so we realized that the corner of the windows had a lot to do with the expansion. The shape of the window was changed into a circular shape and since then, planes were able to avoid fracture issues even without making the windows thicker. I experienced two cases of implanted tearing. If you use non-hex implant, you don't need to process the hex. Hence, the lateral wall can become thicker. Non-hex apartments are more favorable in terms of load distribution because it distributes a stress more easily. I use non-hex implant very frequently. It has undeniable advantage. Non-hex implant may sound foreign. It does not have any hex internally. Let's look at a case. On the right, 4.5 diameter non-hex implant was placed in the past. I tried to place 5.0 diameter in the posterior area, but by using non-hex implant, I was able to reduce diameter by one size. Therefore, I worried less about bone width. And because I worried about inferior alveolar nerve, I placed a 6 millimeter implant. And if you look at the x-ray, you could see that I placed the implant quite deep. Compared to when I placed a 5.0 diameter implant, when I placed a 4.5 diameter implants, I worried less about fracture and my clinical practice became more easier. 
as I place a 4.5 diameter implant in the posterior area, I do at times use 5.0. I My strategy differs depending on the situation. So I am reducing the diameter size these days compared with the past. And I placed the implant using guide and 5.0 diameter implant was placed. Minimum self-contained defect was gained in order to prevent obstruction with the bone graft. The fibrous tissue was removed. If I had used a smaller diameter implant, I think I would have gotten more self-contained space. This is final prosthesis. This is CT image. Buccal bone width was gained with bone graft, but if I had used a smaller diameter implant, I would have been able to gain more sufficient buccal bone width. These days, in similar situations, I use smaller diameter implant and I place more lingually. I was able to get more self-contained space. If you reduce diameter, you can get more sufficient self-contained space and more ample buccal bone. I use smaller diameter non-hex implants and the best non-hex implants are 4.0 and 3.6 diameter implants. I think there absolutely needs to be an alternative for 3.6 diameter. If there can be an implant with less fracture and tear, I think that would be extremely attractive. Because I used a smaller diameter implant, the thread was not exposed and it was all placed within the bony envelope. A bone graft was done. Final prosthesis was provided. I'm not sure whether they all turned into bone, but the volume was secured. I think this is a major advantage to be able to place implant within a bony envelope in the case of anterior area because I was concerned I placed up to 4.5 diameter implant but after using non-hex implant I used the 4.0 and 3.0 diameter implant. Therefore, stress about bone width became much less. This is quite embarrassing, but in 2017, because I was concerned about fractured, I placed two 4.5 diameter implants in the premolar area. The interimplant distance is too close. Even after four years, there's no major problem, but I think it is always at risk of biological complications. This is a similar case. A 3.0 diameter non-hex implant was placed in a more biologically friendly manner in tight space. I think being able to reduce the size of implant diameter is very good in the case of tight spaces. You can see that the surgical site is very tight and guide was used. Hydro lift was used to sinus lift the posterior area. Rich splitting was attempted and implant was placed. But as you can see, rich splitting did not occur properly. And as shown, the results were not really ideal. However, because I used a smaller 4.0 diameter implants and therefore I was able to place implants within the bony envelope. If bony width is insufficient, if you let go a little bit, you can provide a more safe clinical treatment to your patients. Two years later, if you look over here, it's not satisfactory, but minimum bone for retention is there. I really love the non-hex 3.6 diameter implant. The connection is regular connection. There's no longer many connection available. Therefore, you cannot get it mixed up with screw abutment. In this tight space, by using 3.6 non-hex implant, I placed two implants. In such tight spaces, I do not get obsessed about the diameter. And if you're not a person who can do bone graft really well, this can be of great help. Bone graft was done. This was as I was preparing for final prosthesis delivery. If you're excellent in bone graft, this can seem minor, but as a dentist with not so excellent surgical skills, by reducing the diameter, the necessity of bone graft becomes less. So it's really attractive for me. This is summary. In conclusion, I no longer use hex abutment. 
even in single restorations. The reason is simple: because the implant itself is non-hex, so therefore you cannot use hex abutment. This is not ordinary in single restoration. Hex abutment is more widely used. This abutment is about to be freshly released by Austin. It's like a stock abutment. It's a smart abutment. Unless you use guide to position hex, it's not circular, so it's difficult to use hex product. Prosthesis was completed using non-hex smart abutment. This is a different case. I understand that hex is at the center of digital dentistry. I used a non-original abutment, and in one step I tried to fabricate prosthesis, but as I was assembling it, I found the difference with the original product, so in the end, I had to remake it using the original product. This is the final prosthesis. What I want to emphasize is that I do not really know about generic products, but I am concerned whether quality management is well done. More so than hex or non-hex, I think it is important to differentiate original and generic products. As for original products, if you look at the bottom, there is O marked in there. This is the end of my lecture. Dr. Park, thank you for the wonderful lecture and thank you for being right on time. I think we will be entertained. I think we'll be able to entertain more questions. There are so many questions that we've received. So let's look at the chat screen. Previously, Bjorn raised a question. There are so many questions. We're going to skip through other comments. Ayer, I think in terms of prosthesis positioning, I think hex abutment will be more stable. When you connect a non-hex prosthesis, do you need additional appliances like jig or do you just use what's been delivered by the lab? I think for a single restoration, hex looks more stable. So for non-hex, you need jig. Yes, definitely, especially in the case of single restoration. I have some additional slide. I would like to share them to provide more detailed explanation to Ayer. Hex non-hex. A lot of the questions are overlapping in this topic, so I thought ahead of possible questions and made some slides. The biggest downside of non-hex development is repositioning. Actually, there's 10 micrometer gap for hex type as well, and theoretically, it can rotate up to 1.6 degrees. Actually, it does not rotate as much as shown. In the past, when I used a paper chart, I used to attach it to the chart. If you don't have jig, it can become extremely uncomfortable. For contact adding, I removed the prosthesis number 7, started to move, although I just removed number 6. This was a case of cement washout. Sandblasting and contact adjustment was done and then it was positioned. If I did not have jig, I think it would have become much more difficult. Another tip I'd like to provide is that if it is difficult to use hex abutment because of path, this is SS octa abutment. If you use it in a mixed manner, then it would be better to position it. You get the position with one and use the jig to position the prosthesis with the other one. A lot of people wonder whether you can use prosthesis as jig. With time and non-hex abutment, that is the question. After five years, contact loss occurred, prosthesis was removed, and implant level impression was taken for contact adding. The person did not have jig. The prosthesis was used as a jig to reposition the prosthesis. When you adjust a contact, if you just do it randomly, then there can be a lot of difference. In that case, you cannot use prosthesis as jig, even if it is a two-implant case. If you're going to adjust contact, you need to take implant level impression or do pickup impression. It is important so that there is a little difference in terms of contact. Another problem with this patient, the patient was using implant about six years and eight months. This is a slide that I've shown you earlier.
There's another problem, and this is the case I wanted to talk about. The space is too tight. The restorative space was too tight, and in the case of this patient, the margin was subgingival margin to gain more retention. If you ask me if I can use subgingival margin prosthesis to do repositioning, actually, it's going to be extremely difficult to as shown, if it is a two-unit restoration and if the contact difference is minimum and has a supragingival margin, you can use prosthesis as jig. But if it is a subgingival margin prosthesis and if the contact is not right, you cannot do so. You either need to use the original jig or make a new one. How often do you do recall? The patient does not come back as much as I would like sometimes. In my procedure, the most important thing is, actually, it's included in my slide. I think I prepared well for today's lecture because I have answers. This was not pre-planned at all. Let me show you. Because I have a slide, it's really easy to provide explanation. There is a study in 2009 that you, Professor, has mentioned, but Dr. Kim Gi Sung's study is referred to a lot. When you do tightening, sinking down occurs upon tightening as well as occlusal force. Preload loss occurs in this case. So in order to prevent it, I induced the sinking down and then tightened it till abutment level impression was taken. And on the day of a prosthesis setting, I had the patient bite on the cotton for about 10 minutes, during which I tended to another patient. And after that, I tightened once again and then connected the prosthesis. I looked at the study by Kangwon University and significant changes occurred. This is a study that emphasizes retightening to prevent a preload loss. This is a study by Dr. Cho eun -hye. The external implant is butt joint. There is very little sinking down. It Preload loss does not occur significantly due to cyclic loading. However, in the case of internal implant due to sinking down, preload loss can occur. Therefore, retightening is essential. I understand that using provisional for some time and taking a button level impression is good, but I don't really use provisionals. Uh, this is a father-in-law of my peer. I have the patient come in first uh, after about six months or one year. I do retightening then. In one out of 10 cases, uh, the screw becomes loosened. And maintaining implant retightening after loading is very important. We need to make sure that preload is maintained. Maintaining intricate connection is key in using internal implants. So how often do you do it? So upon first retightening after six months or one year, if it does not rotate, I leave it alone for one year. You don't recall after six months if you have good sense. Well, I do retightening within six months or one year. If the patient is unique and if the preload loss is more significant, I have the patient come in six months later again. In the case of this patient, as I retightened continuously, I could not tighten any further. I talk too much, you no. Know? Just because it does not uh, rotate, I think uh, recalling the patient after five years. No, I didn't mean that. I would continuously recall the patient, but would do screw retightening then. The question was about recall. So every six months, you need to check whether there's mobility within the prosthesis. Mobility is not my key point. The, if there's mobility, then it's really problematic. You need to check whether the screw is loosened and you need to retighten it. That is the key in maintaining internal implant. So we retighten and we retighten every six months. And if the patient comes uh, six months later, if there's no mobility in the prosthesis, how can you check whether there's preload loss? 
you cannot uh, tighten every patient whenever the patient comes in. My protocol is I retighten at the first recall. If there's hardly need for retightening, I do it after several years. But if it is slightly more loose, I retighten after six months. And I continue to retighten until there's not much to do else. Even if there's hex, at times it can rotate. You talked about the gap within hex type IR. When you do tightening, the hex, you can sense that it is stopped and you use the wrench with normal torque. In the case of non-hex, will there be no screw loosening if you use a wrench and apply normal torque? I actually prepare for this question as well. So let me go in. Originally, I worked with another dentist for two years and I opened my practice for 10 years in the same location. I experienced a six screw loosening over the past decade. Screw loosening occurred twice. It was a hex single abutment case, two fixture, two implant fractures and two abutment fractures. There are not that many cases. After having provided a single restoration within 14 months, screw loosening occurred and I did retightening. If you look at the image after eight years, there was a slight bone resorption, but then there's also a bone fill. Even with a screw loosening, bone loss can occur. There was bone gain because it was a simple screw loosening issue. After that, there was no more screw loosening for this patient. If there's screw loosening, the soft tissue responds very quickly and you can see the emergent uh, bone loss. If you do screw retightening here, it will solve the problem. In the case of non-hex abutment, this would answer your question, but I only experienced the screw loosening just once. Screw loosening and cement washout occurred five years after placing the implant. It was mobile, so I refabricated the prosthesis and attached it. I adjusted the contact and two months later, there was screw loosening once again in February 2022. I did the same job once again. In June, the same thing occurred and when I observed it closely, abutment was fractured. Screw loosening and non-hex abutment. I've used non-hex abutments for the past decade really a lot and this was the only case where screw loosening occurred. I don't think it just because you use non-hex abutments, screw loosening occurs, but you need to do retightening properly after loading. Also, whether you use original product or generic product also plays in. ID Su, how do you maintain the jig? In the past, I used the chart, but now I give it to the patients. I give it to the patients and I take an image as an evidence so that even if the patient forgets, I get something to show to the patient. At times, patients forget. At times, patients lose it. Then you can just do implant level impression or you can ask the lab to make two jigs. The dentist can keep it and you can give one to the patient, but it may be difficult to maintain it at the dental clinic because there are so many. And it's difficult to classify them, yes. Next, Wani Fafa, I have a lot of concern because I've never used a non-hex abutment. As for non-hex abutment, when you tighten with 30 newtons, due to the tightening force, does it rotate back to its original position? After abutment connection, I think it will not be a problem if you take abutment level impression and fabricate prosthesis. However, if you need to remove it later, is it clinically possible to reposition it? This is something that most people wonder about. I've mentioned it briefly, non-hex abutment. You tighten with your hands. People all agree that after tightening with 30 Newton, even if you apply additional torque, it does not rotate. Most people agree on that. However, if you tighten with your hands and if you apply torque, whether it rotates or not, this is something that a lot of people are curious about. 
To give you a conclusion, there is no straight answer because whether the abutment is original product or generic product, this can come into the play and even if it is original product, this problem can occur. In the case of original abutment, if you tighten with your hands and gradually increase the speed as shown in the research that I've shown you earlier, if you connect the abutment and rotate it slowly 10 newton, 20 newton, and 30 newtons, then the changes that is detectable to human eye is a bare minimum. If you do it rapidly, there can be an issue. Repositioning it to after removal, is it clinically possible? In the case of single restoration, if you don't have jig, it can be very difficult. In the case of multiple cases, if it is supramargin and if there is very little contact difference, you can use prosthesis as jig. Higher implant fracture. If you place it slightly deeply and if the bone housing is sufficient, I don't think there is difference in terms of fracture of hex and non-hex implants. Prosthodontically, non-hex seems to have many advantages, but in terms of surgery, there seems to be little difference between the two. I think non-hex implants have more resistance against implant fracture. First, there's no residual area that occurs upon hex processing. There's no research data. Also, the fixture diameter is more attractive. Doing surgery is quite inconvenient, but by using smaller diameter, you can make bone graft easier. Why is surgery difficult because there's no hex? You're limited in providing torque in the placement direction, and once it is placed because there's no hex, removing the implant, it requires the friction of the mounted, so it's very inconvenient. But the advantage overweighs the downside. 3.6 and 4.0 diameters. I hope this becomes more widely used. Okay. So how can I reposition if I lose the jig? This has been already addressed. How often do you do retightening? This was addressed as well. How can you get to accurate to repositioning if you need to connect the after removing the suprastructure and abutment for contact adding by Stranger20? This was addressed. Clap, clap, clap. At times, even if you take x-ray, it's confusing whether hex connection has been done right. Is there know-how in taking x-ray and reading the x-ray images. This was mentioned again, it's very important. In the case of a double contact abutment from D or M, it's more difficult to find out compared to Austin because it's double contact. Professor Choino has mentioned evil's eye. Can you explain on that? Yes, there are two eyes and mouth. Your explanation really resonated with me. There's the eye over there and the mouth. If it is wrongly connected, the form is weird. You can refer to this. Next, ID Sarasona. Will preload be the same if you tighten the screw with the same amount of torque in the case of hex implant, hex abutment combination and non-hex implant and non-hex abutment combination? I see the question now using same torque to tighten screw. Hex the implant and abutment, non-hex implant and abutment. Will the preload be the same? I'm not a research institute, so I don't know. I think Austin will continue on with the research and will release a lot of studies regarding preload. We're going to research on it and then provide an answer. Rainbow. I just use a hex type abutment. I don't use non hex type. Whenever I connect, I always use jig. Will it prevent wrong connection? If you use hex abutment using jig, it can be quite risky because if impression taking is very accurate, it doesn't matter, but there can be a light 
a little bit of deviation in jig. So for hexabutment, I prefer not using jig because you can get more tactile sense. I connect without jig because the jig comes from the lab. Well, if I use hexabutment, I don't think I'll use a jig. Okay. So as then. Giving positioning jig as a present is a good idea. Question on YouTube. Shouldn't you use hex abutment for single restoration cases? Because if you use non-hex abutment in single restoration, the crown may rotate or screw may loosen. This was already sufficiently addressed. Second question. Highness or awesome magic for which are really popular these days. One piece base abutment is recommended. What's your opinion on that? Will it loosen long term if you don't do regular retightening? This is something that I'm really interested about. Let me show you a slide because it's a similar topic. If you look here, this is a study by Dr. Kim Ji Sung. One piece and two piece transfer abutment were compared. For screw retightening, the sinking occurred more for two piece abutment. One piece abutment is said to be more stable and intricate. Clinically speaking, with time, I've never experienced a rigid abutment, but if you use a rigid abutment for 10 years, you see multiple cases where fracture occurs. I provided prosthesis once again. The one piece abutment, it does not rotate, so why does it loosen and fracture? Because the amount of sinking is not significant. I think if you do not do retightening, preload can be lost. I think you need to use abutment where retightening is possible. I've experienced a similar case in external multi-unit case. Base abutment was used even after 9 years. It looks very nice. Even after 15 years. These cases were done when I was a resident. I was a really a beginner. This is a multi-unit abutment. This is 14 years, 7 years, and 15 years. When I looked at the cases when I did as a resident, even after 15 years, it is well maintained. There are so many cases with over 15 years elapsed, 11 years, 9 years. If you look at these, multi-unit abutment seems quite attractive. Can you apply them in internal type as well? I want to ask you a question, Professor. If you do it like this, it is better in terms of stress distribution. Multi-unit is better. If you use two-piece or three-piece, it is good for stress distribution and it has good impact on screw loosening. Using this without retightening. Can you do retightening? Or is it a protocol not to do retightening? I think we need to think about it. Even in such cases, I recommend multi-unit pieces instead of one piece. Screw retightening is possible in some cases as well. So there were a lot of fractures with rigid abutment. I fear if there's going to be fracture in multi-unit bridges. In the case of Awesome, it's a three-unit. DM6206. In the case of bridge, depending on path, I choose whether or not to use hex or non-hex. If the path is good, will it be more favorable to use non-hex? I use digital dentistry and fabricate the screw type prosthesis. In multiple cases, I don't think you should use internal conical type T as a screw type implant. The abutments need to be in precise contact. Hence, if you use a screw type, there can be stress leading to fracture of implant. In single case, you can do with screw type, but for multiple case, I oppose both hex and non-hex. And multiple case attaching to model, I, I'm against that. Depending on placement path, if it is not severely deviated, 
the hex type it falls off so you recommend er type or cementation type but yes i prefer er type the most because removal is one thing but i think screw retightening is absolutely necessary so upon an implant to abutment connection what margin do you recommend it differs depending on interior and posterior region Bian, thank you for the nice comments. Cool all. In the extraoral test, when a screw was tightened, abutment did not rotate, but clinically speaking, without jig, if you connect the non-hex due to the resistance from the gingiva, if the jig is not accurate, the non-hex abutment can rotate upon the screw tightening. Precision seems to be essential in non-hex jig. What kind of instructions can I give to the lab? How should jig be fabricated? A jig needs to wrap well up to 15 to 10 newton. Once it is tightened up to that point, if you do tightening slowly, after that, the jig is not really important. More steeper friction occurs in 15 newton centimeters, and up to that point, jig is important. I put jig on the occlusal table of the mesial tooth. I don't just put it on top, I have my staff press upon it with a forcep. I have the patient to press upon it in order to prevent jig movement. Setting it is important, but the important thing is to be able to have the patient press upon the jig with a forcep. You need to have the right position. I place the jig on the occlusal table side. Understood. TS. In the case of non hex as the contact surface increases between a pop and an implant, is there a study or material where finite element analysis has been done or mechanical analysis has been done? If you look at the research done by Awesome Research Center about stress distribution, and there was also a study done by Gangneung University about uh, the contact surface. The university paper only emphasized that the contact surface was wide and it did not mention any impact. ID Gung, what if I lose the non hex abutment jig and if the crown has fallen off, how can I set it? Is there an appropriate way? You need to have the lab remake the jig after taking implant level impression. There are so many questions. We only have limited time and there are so many questions. Dranger 20, in terms of a fracture resistance, non-hex 3.6 diameter, which hex implant diameter is similar to that? I think it requires more study. I just came to my own conclusion that it is more favorable. Okay, I'm going to just read some questions. Because of time constraint, Yeonji Shi. In a single restoration case and not a bridge case, in the case of external type, I use hex, and in the case of internal type, I use non hex at the same time. Non hex is known to have less screw loosening compared to hex. If the inter arch distance is tight, in fabricating one piece, I've used a lot of non hex abutments. Do you have experience using hex? Do you make the decision factory in the contour? I'm just reading the questions out loud. You need to select the best question. Stranger 20. Do you need additional placement tool for non hex implant? Yes, you require additional tool and it's inconvenient, but it's possible. These questions will be answered by Dr. Park separately. Uh huh. In bridge type, what do you think about using hex and non hex type together? I think it's really good. There are so many questions. Good luck. Had we one, two. The hex area of abutment, I think it is known that the weak point of implant exists. Tearing occurs from the implanted top. How can I interpret this? I've seen more cases where it's connected from the top to the corner. I hear if you make one hex, then it can be used as a jig. I think there are deviations with a non-hex jig. What are your experience clinically? If you take about my level impression, then this will solve the problem. Yeah, 
Wooden folks, see if you use smart abutment after taking abutment level impression, do you make prosthesis then? Or do you take implant level impression and set the abutment and prosthesis at the same time? Abutment level impression taking. In this case, you would not need the jig. In removing prosthesis, how do you do it? I think the downside of my way is, is related to removing cement. That's why I don't take it out. If necessary, I take implant level impression and then make a jig once again. Okay. Byon. It's true with hex, but for non-hex, the precision of rod processing seems very important. Buying legitimate Austin rod would be very important for non-hex. Yes, that's true. It's important for hex and non-hex. I don't think hex serves anti-rotation function. Understood? Dr. Park, you have provided wonderful lectures, so there are so many questions. I would like to apologize to all people who have raised the questions for not being able to address them properly today. I would like to express my gratitude to all of you who have participated on the chat. You have already chosen one best question. Can you pick two more best questions? Winners of Maserati tumblers? I would like to choose Wani Fafa. This person has really hit the mark in that the question was what a lot of people are curious about regarding whether rotation occurred upon applying torque. I was not able to catch the nickname properly. I think I'd be able to find that person if I looked at the replies. Den Jung. I agree that preload maintenance is important. I want to choose this person. Okay, thank you. Den Jung. Wani Papa, congratulations. Separate contact will be made to those who have raised the best questions. Once the address is confirmed, the gift will be sent via parcel delivery. Don't be too let down just because you have not been chosen as best a question. Among those who have raised questions real time, there will be a lucky draw and Starbucks coffee coupon will be sent. This wonderful chat event will continue in the next lecture as well, so I look forward to a lot of your attention and participation. Now I think we need to move on to the final stage. Could you give a word of advice to your peers who are studying really hard watching the program? Thank you for watching the program. I think it is ultimately the clinician's choice to use HEX or non-HEX. If you know the advantages and disadvantages, you can use whichever. If you're going to use hex, so you need to be aware of the wrong connection of hex. If you are aware and pay more attention to it, hex abutment can be great. You need to check it with x-ray and you need to use all your senses. Professor Cho has mentioned the evil eye and it really resonated with me and I was able to detect it better. Thank you once again for coming all the way from Seosan. Despite your busy schedule, if there's opportunity, I would like to invite you once again. Dear viewers of Prosthodontics on Friday, how did you like the Prosthodontics on Friday program celebrating the second anniversary? We were able to understand the pros and cons of hex and non-hex abutment with Dr. Park Jonghyun. I think today's Prosthodontics on Friday was extremely meaningful and useful. Thank you for all the questions. Questions that were not answered will be addressed via replies. Next time around, we're going to provide a lecture under the topic minor tooth movement to provide a better implant prosthesis. This lecture will be provided by Dr. Cho Yongjin of Seoul Deep Rooted Dental Clinic. Thank you for watching our program, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.